before public address systems were common and and apparently shouted in order to be heard to the point that if he spoke more than about 10 or 12 minutes publicly, he would lose his voice and that would last for weeks. But when he moved to the congregation where I grew up, where he first served as preacher and then later as an elder and was a local businessman, the elders who brought him there encouraged him not to get out and beat the bushes and make converts. The man who had preceded him had baptized 200 the year before. He told the elders, don't don't expect that I will have that kind of record. And they said, brother, if you can get 5% of those whom he baptized to come back and be faithful, we'll be satisfied. The man he followed succeeded in baptizing many, but in converting, it seems, very few. Uh, No preacher can guarantee that those whom he teaches and baptizes and converts will continue faithful. The corollary to that, though, is that if you do not preach the pure gospel, if you do not preach the whole counsel of God, uh, there's no logical reason for anyone to be faithful. Paul is emphasizing to these Galatian Christians You received the gospel. You received the whole message. You received everything that you need in order to be motivated and have the knowledge to remain faithful to Christ, yet you're not remaining faithful to Christ. Who cast a spell on you? I want to know something. Verse 2, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And this really gets down to the heart of the issue that was troubling the Galatian churches that apparently was imported into the church at Rome, as we saw in the book of Romans, this tension, this argument back and forth by some about how are you justified? Is it by works of law? Is it by hearing of faith? Do you do you have to have faith and then add works of, of merit, works of law on top of that, which is the contention of the Judaizers in this scenario? Now, The answer to the question, if they concede we're justified by faith, well, then all argument is taken away from the Judaizers. There is no wind in their sails. The the balloon has been popped. Uh, the, the, The argument is moot. If they concede that point, all ground is taken away because as Paul has already shown to the Galatian churches, it cannot be both. It's either or. Now, are you so foolish, Paul asks. The the English standard here, uh, are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Uh, This doesn't make sense. This is an illogical connection. Now, uh, this expression, these are the the usual words, having begun, are you made perfect? This describes in in the idolatrous community the beginning and the end of a sacrifice, a religious sacrifice. This is the normal Greek terminology that would have been familiar to these people for hundreds of years before the gospel ever came along that they would associate with being justified in their various pagan religions by some offering or sacrifice. You bring the sacrifice, you offer it, you began in the spirit, that is, you you, you started out uh, with a good intention, and you ended up with this, a dead animal. The first word, having begun, actually is is an agricultural word. It's it's scattering grains of of barley in and on the, the victim of sacrifice, a fertility rite, if you will. Are you then made perfect? Do you finish? Are you completed in this ritual? If so, why did you suffer so many things? Did you suffer so many things in vain? What what purpose did it serve? Now, Paul is hoping in asking that 
He's hoping for their salvation. He's anticipating their, their continuing faithfulness. But what he's seeing so far leaves some doubt in his mind. Now, question, what persecutions had they suffered? Look again at verse 4. Did you suffer so many things in vain? What did they suffer? I have no idea. To my knowledge, there is no biblical record of, of this that Paul is describing here. We have no way of knowing. Uh, would it have been some uh, contention on the pagan Gentile heathen community? Perhaps so. Uh, it, it's interesting that passing through this particular region in his evangelistic efforts, Paul wanted to go north into Bithynia, uh, in, into what we would call Indo-Europe, and, and was prevented and instead is redirected to, to Macedonia, to, to Greece in the book of Acts. Well, wh what about that Indo-European area? That was, that was a, an area of fierce tribes people, an area of, of violent paganism at times. Did that have something to do with it? Were they assaulted in some way? Was it uh, the influence of Jews, on the other hand, that was causing? We don't know. The Bible doesn't give us a record. Ms. Sherry? For the most part, uh, Christians were, uh, particularly Jewish Christians, were social outcasts in Jewish society. Now, that degree of outcast probably varied somewhat in the pagan world because paganism, amongst other things, tended to be uh, polytheistic. So adopting from the outside looking in, adopting yet another religion in addition to the four, five, six, eight, ten that you already acknowledged might not have carried quite the same stigma until what? until it becomes obvious that this is not just a monotheistic religion, but it is an exclusive religion. Might that have engendered some, some persecution, some harassment, some suffering on the part of these Galatian Christians? Perhaps so. We could speculate till the cows come home, but the answer is we don't actually know. So the question in verse 2, did you receive... Uh, did, did you did you learn faith? Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He comes back to that at verse 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you. Does he do it by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, why would Paul reiterate the question? As parents, have you ever looked at your child and said, do thus and such and so and so? And then when they did not immediately respond, looked again and said, do you hear me? That's effectively what Paul is doing. It's for emphasis sake. He's, he who supplies literally is he who, who overflows you, who, who abundantly supplies you. Uh, it's a fascinating word here. It actually describes one who originally owned a chorus. And he supplied the needs of all of the members, the, the owner of the show, as it were. Uh, but the point takes us back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10 and 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. That is, the one who supplies everything you need from an inexhaustible source. Uh, we live in an in a environment, a society, a time where the inexhaustible source in the mind of most people seems to be the federal government. Uh, an endless supply of money. Just print more, print more. Well, uh, that, that just goes to show that a lot of people don't understand what money represents. But the idea of an endless supply here, an ex inexhaustible supply, is the idea of one who can address, can take care of every conceivable need. He provides miracles. He provides miraculous ability. Now that tells us the timing of this. This we're into the 
uh, beginnings of the second generation of the church. The gospel is still in the process of being written down. Miracles are still needed. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you've got the list of the, the gifts of the Spirit, the miraculous abilities that the apostles could impart by the laying on of their hands. But that need for these things is still present because the Word is still in the process of being revealed. But here, did you, did you, uh, does he do this by works of the law? All of this ability, all of, all of these uh, things that God ministers to you, God provides to you, is it by works of the law? The word here takes us down to chapter, or back rather to chapter 2 and verse 8, where, where we have uh, God working through Peter and Paul alike. But works of law, works of faith. Verses 6 through 9 take us to that discussion, really, that, that whole uh, analysis that Paul gives. Notice at verse 6, just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him or reckoned to him for righteousness. Paul is going to do with the Galatian churches the same thing that he had done with the Romans, the same thing that the Hebrews writer frequently does with the Hebrew Christians. He takes them back to Abraham. He takes them back to the progenitor of the faithful, the father of the faithful, as it were, that takes away the argument, that undercuts the argument of the Judaizers that it's the law, the law, the law, the law, because Abraham, A, is unequivocally justified by faith, and B, he predates the law by nearly 500 years. So, works of law, works of faith. Abraham was accounted righteous before circumcision was instituted, according to Romans chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. So, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Here Paul is assembling his, his argument. Abraham was accounted righteous. Therefore, since the, the seed of Abraham are promised justification, it is those who are of faith, like Abraham, who are his children. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, what? In thee, through you, shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So then they which be of what? Faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So we take this piece by piece. Know this in verse 7. Here is a command, an imperative. You need to... Now, do the Galatian Christians intellectually, do they know this? Sure. Undoubtedly, they have been aware of this. But when you've got someone with a uh, putatively deeper background in the scriptures of the Old Testament than you have, telling you this is how it has been for a thousand years and this is how it must continue to be, uh, might you be hesitant to reject that? We live in an era of uh, qualification, of certification. Uh, an individual with a college degree in the, in the estimation of many people in our society, even now, if you have that bachelor's degree, intellectually you outrank somebody who has a high school diploma. If you have a master's, you're another rung up on the ladder above the person with a bachelor's. If you have a PhD, you know everything, don't you? Well, no. Who does the PhD call when his sink gets plugged up? He calls the guy that maybe didn't even finish high school, but knows how to unplug the sink. Where does the PhD go when his car won't start? Now, anymore, you just about have to have a college degree to work on a modern automobile. But he calls the guy that is willing to get his hands dirty. The mechanic. We live in an era of qualification. The first century, in some respects, was a little bit like that. 
the Judaizers come along and say, this is how it's been for a thousand years. Why should it change now? Well, what are they presenting? They're not presenting the fact that Abraham is accounted righteous on the basis of his faith. What are they presenting? Why, we've had the law for a thousand years. And the interpretation of it is, is, is fixed. We know what it means. Well, no, you don't. Because you've, you, your, your ancestors have perverted it for several hundred years. And that's what got them into trouble and captivity in the first place. But know this, Paul says. Pay attention to this. The scripture, and he's talking about the Old Testament here, particularly Genesis, anticipated what was to come. That's interesting. The scripture foreseeing preached the gospel beforehand. Paul is identifying the scripture with the one who gave it. God is identified with his word in these words. What the scripture promises, God promises. That's because God is who? He's the author. He's the, the speaker of scripture. Those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Those whose, whose justification rests on their faith in God, rests on their confession of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, rests on their reception of the message of hope. They're the ones who are justified. But then go on to verse 10, and as we progress, we're, we're going to move from the, the initial argument here that justification is by faith, not by works. We're going to move on then to the application of that in verses 10 through 14. And the application is, if justification is by faith, well then, how do the righteous live? The righteous must live by faith. As many as are under the works of the law or are of the works of the law are under a curse. Why? Cursed is one who does not continue in these things. One offense disqualifies you as well as violating systematically everything that you could violate. In this scenario, what Paul is emphasizing for the benefit of the Galatian Christians is that what they're hearing from the Judaizing teachers would put them in the same position as the Judaizing teachers. Now, what are the Judaizers telling them? As, as we try to interpret the scenario that's being presented here, as we go back and look at chapter 2 and, and Peter's and Barnabas's behavior after messengers came uh, from James, what are, what are the Judaizers telling them? In a nutshell, you've got to be like us. You've got to copy us. You've got to follow our example. Well, what is Paul telling them? If you do that, you will be following their example. And their example is they're putting themselves under a curse. They're separating themselves from God. They're not being blessed because of this. They're separating themselves from God by putting themselves back under a law that no longer has any power to do what? And yet it could not justify in the first place. How could the law ever save any Jew? There, there, you, there you go. And that's where Paul is going here in chapter 3 by leading them to Christ. Go to Hebrews chapter 11 and in the, the hall or chapter, yeah, chapter 11 in the, the hall of fame of the faithful, what point does the, the Hebrews writer make? All these died in faith, not having received the promise. But what did they have? They had the anticipation of it. They looked forward to it. They recognized that it was coming. So, 
the application here, no one is justified by the law in the sight of God. That's evident. That should be screamingly obvious. How so? Well, the Old Testament, Habakkuk 2 and verse 4, had stated plainly, the just shall live by faith. Now, the Judaizers might try to claim, well, Abraham is, a, is a, an exception. He's a special case. And so what does Paul do? He quotes Habakkuk. Habakkuk came along hundreds of years later. Habakkuk was not in the context talking about Abraham. Who was he talking about? He, he's talking, exactly. He's talking about ordinary Jews living under the law, ordinary Hebrews. The just shall live by faith. We'll go back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. Therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith. Where? In the gospel. In the message that follows the law. <clears throat> go over to Hebrews 10 and verse 38. You have the same point being made. The gist of this is that Paul is saying, <clears throat> pardon me. The gist of this is that Paul is saying, it's the one who is righteous by faith, who is justified by faith, who will live, not the one who is claiming justification on the basis of law. The justified by faith shall live. If you're justified by faith, the outcome is you live. So, uh, what is it to live in this scenario, in this context? What, what, I mean, Paul's not talking to dead people, physically or spiritually, really, because this letter is addressed. Go back to chapter 1. To whom did Paul address this letter? To the churches, Christians in Galatia. He's, talk, he's addressing people who are alive in Christ, at least for the moment, as long as they don't go back or turn aside into uh, the Judaizing doctrine. But what is it then to, to live in Christ? Go over to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. That life in Christ is enjoying the peace that passes all understanding, that guards the hearts and minds in Christ. Not in the law, but in Christ. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, what is it to live in Christ? It's to be righteous in the sight of God. In John chapter 17 in verse 3, what had Jesus said to his disciples? Those who live have fellowship with God in Christ. Yes, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, and, and Peter's practical application is that you have joy unspeakable. You're, you, you live a life full of glory. You're transformed into the image of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But go on here, yet the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. A system that demands complete obedience, a law system that demands complete obedience does not rest on mercy, grace, faith. Even the ones who kept the law had to do what? They had to offer sacrifices, didn't they? They looked forward to Christ by faith for their ultimate forgiveness. Isn't it interesting to think about the fact that in Acts chapter 2, Peter and the eleven confronted a ready-made audience in a manner of speaking. A group of people among whom were many who were obviously looking for the Messiah. Now, uh, now when, when the apostles come to Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, here's a high holy day. That you've got Jews from all over the world gathered at the temple for that that holy day, that event. And what are many of them doing philosophically, emotionally, spiritually as Jews? They're looking for the Messiah. 
They're anticipating. They, they've, they've read, they've studied, they, they know that they're familiar with the writings of Daniel. And, and they know that, that Daniel's countdown clock, in a manner of speaking, it, it, it's coming to its end. It's got to be sometime any, any day now, as it were. When they hear the message, when they see the signs, 3,000 of them put it together, don't they? Now, probably 30,000 reject it because they're steeped in their traditions. But here, you've got a group of people who have spent their lives keeping the law, anticipating, and when the time arrives, when the moment comes, they recognize it. They look forward by faith to forgiveness in the Messiah. They're looking for the Messiah. Now, why was Jesus rejected and crucified by the leadership? Well, it's the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, it, it is part of God's plan. But from a purely human point of view, what did the high priest say on the subject? It's expedient that one man should die for the people. And in its context, what's he saying to his fellow rulers? Better that one man should die so that we can stay in power than that we should be thrown out of power and maybe have a, a, a whole uh, tumult in the process. But not all Jews thought like he did. The common people heard Jesus gladly. They were looking for their Messiah. The ones who kept the law still had to sacrifice. In, in fact, uh, you go to Galatians 4 for just a moment, and what do we read? In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Born when? Under the law. What does that mean as far as Jesus' life and practice in the course of his earthly tenure? He's absolutely under the law too. Until his resurrection until his crucifixion and resurrection. And he keeps the law perfectly. He demonstrates that in theory, it is possible to practice flawlessly. But even so, what did the law require? Consider the question of the temple tax. The Jews asked Peter, does your master pay the temple tax? And Peter was like, "Why, well, I'm certain, certainly, of course he does. He's he's a he's a good Jew." And then he goes, uh, "Lord, what what do we do about this? Peter, go fishing. You'll catch a fish with a coin in its mouth. Take the coin; it'll be enough to pay your share and mine." Though, what else does he tell Peter? Yes. Exactly, the son in the house doesn't pay taxes; the stranger does. But exactly. Go ahead and observe the niceties of the law, as it were. What's Paul driving at here? Forgiveness is by faith. Forgiveness is not by any law. God did not give laws to justify anyone. Why did he give laws? To guide the faithful. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. It's written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree or who hangs on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. He redeemed us. How did he redeem them? He paid the purchase price by which one who is enslaved is set free. The slaves of sin are not manumitted willingly by the slaveholder, that is, by the master of sin. Their ransom is paid. Those who are trying to save themselves, trying to buy their way out of enslavement in sin by the law, well, they're cursed because they're enslaved to their own inability to do that. If you commit one transgression, you're as guilty as if you commit all. 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, where are you going to go to get back to perfect? Where are you going to go? What price are you going to pay to get back to innocent? What did Jesus say in Matthew 16, verse 26, the, the two rhetorical questions there? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The implication being, <laughs> you can have the whole world and that's not enough. The corollary being, how much is your soul worth? Your soul is worth more than the whole world. He's redeemed us out from under the curse. It was, it was over us. It was hanging over our heads, as it were. Uh, cursed is everyone who hangs on a, on a tree. Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and, and 23. Well, it's the dead body that's cursed by God. Jesus, lifelong obedience to the law. He's immune to the curse of the law because he's never sinned. But he was crucified. He was hanged on a tree. He remains immune to the curse of the law. It's not possible for him to be held under that curse. He came out from under. Now, the, the exposure on a practical level uh, under the law, the exposure of a corpse uh, on, a, on a tree, on a pole, on a cross, that was not supposed to be prolonged past sundown. The Romans typically in crucifying someone would leave them on the cross until death, which especially if they were roped onto the cross rather than might take several days if the individual was strong. Remember the object of crucifixion. The object of crucifixion was not merely execution. It was, and, and it was not only humiliation, but to do what? To inflict the maximum amount of intense suffering possible. Exactly. Prior to death. It was a deterrent. People walk by and see that. Oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want that to happen to me. So, the exposure of a corpse in public, on a tree, on a cross, something like that, uh, that was not supposed to be prolonged past sundown under Jewish law. The elders, the, the scribes, and the chief priests go to Pilate and say, you know, we, we, we want to have their legs broken so that they'll die. Before sundown, it's we're, we're coming up on a on a high day, on a high Sabbath. We don't want them out there. And he gives permission. So they break the legs of the two thieves. They pierce the side of Jesus because he's already died. They were surprised that he had already died. Tells you something about his uh, evident physical appearance. He looked strong enough that he ought to still be alive. They were surprised that he wasn't, but they pierced his side. It's an affront to human decency, you think about uh, medieval executions. They, they take the pirate and they put him in the iron cage outside the, the, the castle wall at the mouth of the bay as a deterrent to other pirates, and they let him stay there and rot, literally. Well, it's an affront to human decency, but it's an affront to God himself. Jesus endured that, that curse of being hanged up in public in order to redeem us from the curse pronounced. Why had the curse been pronounced in the first place? None had ever kept any law perfectly. Had Jesus simply substituted one system of law for another, we'd still be under a curse, wouldn't we? We'd still have the same problem. What system of law in all of human existence has anyone ever managed to observe perfectly? 
you know, one of the aspects of law is that law does not take into account accidents. Have you ever exceeded the speed limit without intending to? The very first speed t- speeding ticket I ever got, and I haven't had many, but I've had a couple through the years. The very first one I ever got at 17 years old was unintentional. That's not to say I never exceeded the speed limit intentionally at that age. I was a normal teenage boy. But the first time I got caught, I didn't even realize I was going over the speed limit, and it was not intentional. But the fact that it wasn't intentional, the fact that it was accidental, did not mitigate my guilt. I still had to pay the fine and pay the points on my insurance and try to keep that hidden from my parents until many, many years later. (laughs) Replacing one system of law that could not save with another system of law leaves those under that law in the same pickle. The blessing of Abraham that comes on the Gentiles at verse 14 is that everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, receives the promise of the Spirit through faith. So how does Jesus become a blessing now? He was under the curse of the law in verse 13. How does he become a blessing now? He took the law to the cross. Colossians 2 and verse 14, the bond written in ordinances was nailed to his cross with him. Its force died when he died. How so? Go back to Jesus' own words in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to brim full it, the law of Moses. And go to Romans chapter 1 and What do we find in verse 4? God showed his approval of what Jesus did. How? By raising him from the dead. God God the Father demonstrates his acceptance of Jesus' offering of himself by not leaving him under that curse, but raising him from the dead. Therefore, the rest of chapter 3 emphasizes a simple point. The gospel, the faith that it induces, makes it superior to the law. It makes it a better way. So, brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Uh, To give a, a human example, the English Standard Version says, Even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. You don't get to tinker with it. Uh, Brethren, it softens the the tone here a little bit. You think about what Paul is writing to the Galatian churches. And this is really, when you take it as, as a whole, it's rather pointed, isn't it? It's pretty severe in tone. So what does Paul do? He's dealing with an issue where souls hang in the balance because if they fall into this, if they remain in this trap of being bewitched by these would-be doctors of the law, their souls are forfeit. And combating that, in the heat of battle, you can get, your, your blood can get up, you know, your, your ire can get aroused. So how does Paul combat that tendency? He reminds them of the relationship they share. Brethren, that softens the, the severe tone here. That which was, was confirmed, was ratified. Uh, and what, what is he talking about? Well, at verse 16, to Abraham and his seed, his descendants, There were promises made. But notice, it's not seeds, descendants, plural. It's seed, singular, to your offspring. How many children, according to the promise, did Abraham have? One. 
Abraham actually fathered uh, almost 10 sons. He fathered Ishmael. He fathered Isaac. He married Keturah after Sarah died and fathered a whole parcel of children, sons and daughters with her. But how many according to the promise? One. To your seed. That was the one who mattered. And it was through him that the seed, the Savior, would come. And the seed in view is not Isaac, not Jacob, not mighty David, not wise Solomon. The seed in view is the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ. And do remember, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a description, a title, if you will. You could just as well say Messiah or Savior. God did not promise salvation to Abraham's uh, physical descendants. Now, are some of Abraham's physical descendants included here? Absolutely. Paul is one of them. But the focus is not on the physical descendants. If that were the case, Ishmael's children would, should all be guaranteed salvation. Keturah's children all should be guaranteed salvation. But he spoke to one seed through Isaac all the way to the Savior. And it's not physical descendants, but those who are true believers, Jew or Gentile, and only to them. Does not say to offspring as of many, but one who is Christ. Now, the explanation, he's saying that the this this great blessing of salvation by faith, of justification, redemption, righteousness by faith, it is concentrated, focused in one person. That's Jesus. And in that one person alone. Through him, everyone, Jew and Gentile, has the potential to be blessed. His sacrifice is sufficient for all. And so it's in that sense that seed is distinctively singular, not plural. But now the explanation of what he's talking about. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years after, after what? After the promise. After the promise to Abraham. After Abraham was accounted righteous. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. The law didn't take the place of the promise. If the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So, the law dates back how far? When did Moses live? approximately. Roughly speaking, about, about, but it depends on your, your, your archaeological scholarship and so forth. Some would say as late as 1200 BC. Some would say as early as 1500 BC. Roughly speaking, well over a thousand years, probably closer to about 1400 years before the birth of Jesus. 430 years pass before all of this law business comes along. There's already a covenant in place. What's the covenant? The covenant goes back to Genesis 19. The covenant goes back to the promise. I'll bless you. I'll give you descendants. I'll give you land, and I'll bless everybody else through your seed, through you. God had given them a written law through Moses somewhere between 1500 and 1200 B.C. That law came 430 years after he made that promise to Abraham. So that promise to Abraham goes back to potentially almost 2,000 years before Jesus.
And far from canceling out that promise, what was the effect of the law? The law is actually a step toward fulfillment. How so? How is the law a step toward the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham? Well, it, it prepares the way. It introduces the, the concept of righteousness. The law defines righteousness in, in, a, in a very concrete, written way. It, it, it prepares the people for the idea of righteousness, the concept of it. But what else does it do? Think about this. It establishes a visible, objective standard, a measurable standard of righteousness. Now, what's the measurable standard of righteousness under the law? How are you righteous under the law? By keeping the law, but keeping the law how? Completely, perfectly, totally, sinlessly. That's the standard of righteousness. You're righteous if you're sinless. If you're not sinless, you're not righteous. Except the law prescribes sacrifices, offerings for sin that do what? They anticipate the ultimate offering. They do not, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, they do not in and of themselves expiate the guilt of the sinner. They are a gesture of anticipation, an act of faith, if you will, anticipating the perfect sacrifice. The law is a step toward fulfillment. How so? It defines it gives an objective image of righteousness so that when Jesus, born of a woman under the law, comes into this world and sinlessly fulfills every requirement, demonstrating his flawlessness, his perfection, his idealness, his innocence. He then can offer himself in place of us. His blood offered in place of ours can cleanse us. God had probated his will. He had ratified this covenant with Abraham before the law ever came along, before the law was ever given. So the coming of the law doesn't, doesn't disqualify. It doesn't replace, it doesn't uh, cancel out that covenant, it moves it one step closer to fulfillment. Now, there are two things that God cannot do. What are they? God cannot lie. And what else can God not do? Well, he he's, cannot be associated with sin. That's, that's true, too. I guess the three things in that sense. But here, he can't he can't break his oath. You go over to Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 17 and 18, Titus chapter 1, verse 2, it's impossible for God to lie when God could not swear by anyone greater than he is, because there is no one greater than he is. Who does he swear by? He interposes with an oath by himself. I swear by me, this will happen. And sure enough, it did. So. The application then, if the inheritance comes according to the law, by the law, if, 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 if our inheritance is based on the law, it can't be based on the promise. It, it's, it can't be both. And that's what the Judaizers are trying to contend for. It, it's got to be, but yes, you're you're saved by faith, but you've got to stay saved by works of the law. You've got to continue. We we can't just abandon that. If 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 we turn away from this, we're turning away from everything that God has has ever preached, taught, said. No, 
you, you don't understand. That brought us here. Here doesn't take us back there. If the inheritance of Abraham's descendants was based on the law of Moses alone, then it would belong to the people of the law, the Jews. But what about everybody else that God made? Now, bear in mind, some perhaps among the Judaizing folks, they wouldn't have any problem with that. Even the apostles in Acts 1 were still asking Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, you've got 500 years of these people being steeped in the idea, okay, we're scattered among the nations. That must be the explanation of God blessing among the nations. All, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That means Jews wherever they are. They don't just have to be right here in, in the promised land. God will bless Jews in Rome or in Spain or in, in Babylon or, or wherever. No, God will not bless only Jews. If it was on the basis of the law, only Jews would be blessed. But if it's based on the promise given to Abraham, Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham is our father. Yes, but Abraham's not a Jew. <laughs> Abraham came along long before there were any Jews. And the promise, generations before there were any Jews, is not affected by the law. It's not canceled out in any way by the giving of the law. Well, all right then, if, if that's the case, Paul, what's the point of the law? Verse 19, <laughs> the law was to regulate your transgressions. The law was because you were already misbehaving, and this provides a standard to measure it. It was added because of transgression until the offspring, until the seed should come to whom the promise has been made. It was put in place by angels through an intermediary. It was prescribed, appointed. Well, what does that say? It was until the seed shall come. Do this until I get back. What does that say? When do, when, when do you stop? Yeah. When I get back, you can stop. Jump up and down until I return. When I return, can I stop jumping now? Yes, I'm back. That's the point. The law was temporary. The law was temporary from the get-go. In fact, telling Moses this is temporary seemed to have no effect on these people. It was interposed or it was authenticated by angels. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2. You find that also in Hebrews 2 and verse 2. Now, therefore, an intermediary implies more than one. But God is one. That takes us back to something that would be fundamental to these Jews. A mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. What's the first scripture traditionally that a Jewish child is taught? Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, commonly called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. A mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. An agreement founded on law always involves at least two people, two or more. Any legal agreement depends on both sides keeping their respective parts of it. Any contract. You get ready to buy a house, Mike. You contract. <laughs> you can't afford it. <laughs> Amen. You contract for a certain price. And once that contract is signed, what does that contract do? It obligates. Who does it obligate? It obligates you as the purchaser to pay that full price, but it also obligates the seller to accept that price. 
A promise does not depend on two people. Who does a promise depend on? The person that made it. A promise is given by one. And nothing that anyone else can do can break or alter that promise. Forty-three and a half years ago, on the evening of May 30th, 1980, my wife and I stood before a dear friend, gospel preacher, a mentor, and we promised, we vowed that we would be husband and wife until we are parted by death. And we've had a few near-death experiences through the years, and not all of them involve sickness. She's nearly killed me a time or two. <laughs> I say that facetiously. She's probably wanted to. She might be. We have been faithful for 43 and a half years. If one or the other should stray, God forbid, that does not release either of us from the promise that we made. There is still a promise in effect. Now, is God willing to release in that circumstance? In that one. But even that release is not automatic. And it's not his ultimate desire. Yes? Differentiate the promise and covenant. Is there a difference between a promise and a covenant? Yes. A promise is made by one with basically without respect to the uh, actions or the the uh, acceptance, rejectance, re rejection, what have you, of the object of the promise. A covenant is an agreement. So a covenant is not the same as a promise in that the covenant to be enforced must be accepted by both. Now, having said that, is there more than one kind of covenant? Absolutely. Our 50 states individually have covenanted together to be a federal body, the United States. But what was necessary for that to take place? <laughs> Constant battling and fighting for the interests of states versus the federal government. Negotiation. That's one kind of covenant where this side gives a little and this side gives a little and this side gives a little and this side gives a little. and. Ultimately, we meet somewhere approximating the middle. We negotiate. But that's not the only kind of covenant. And that's, in fact, not the kind of covenant at all that we see in the Scriptures, typically. When God offers a covenant, He offers what is typically described as a sovereign covenant, which is to say, God says, here are the terms. If you do this, 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 I will bless you in all of these multitude of ways and, and invariably the blessings far, far outweigh any requirements or stipulations he puts on us. But if you fail in that, 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 or that, then I will, in various ways, punish, curse, uh, discipline you. And that's what really Hebrews chapter 12 is all about. In a sovereign covenant, the object of that promise has two options. We accept, we reject. Go, go, exactly. There is no negotiating. There is no, well, now wait a minute. You know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, to, to, to borrow from Ted Koppel many, many years ago, God gave 10 commandments at Sinai, not ten suggestions. Uh, somewhere in, in my files, I have a uh, 
cartoon that depicts Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with 15 commandments and he tripped and dropped one of the tablets. Oh, there's 10 now. It didn't work that way. A promise is a promise of one. It depends on one. A covenant, is there any similarity between the two? Yes. Is there, can there be overlap between the two? Yes. But in a sovereign covenant, the promise is on God's part. The acceptance or rejection is all that man is allowed. One thing I might want to add to that in the sense that uh, covenants really is, is greater than agreement. I mean, it's greater than an agreement. We can have an agreement, a mm -hmm. contract with uh, buying a house, which is yep. narrowly it's an agreement. The covenant is uh, in that same sense, but it's based on a relationship. Yes, that's a good that's point. Significant. That, that's a good point. The covenant is rooted in the relationship between the parties, not just random Absolutely. connection. You know, uh, you bought your Toyota pickup from a dealership somewhere or from someone, uh, from a friend. Okay, a brother. So in, in that sense, you do have some relationship with that individual, but the corollary to that is if something happens with a truck, you really have no recourse back to that individual because it's not their truck anymore. They're not responsible. They didn't build it. Uh, your recourse, if you bought it from the dealer, would be to go back to the dealer. But if the dealer does not give satisfaction, what relationship do you have with that dealer? I'm never going to buy another car there again. So your, your point about relationship is well taken here in the, the character of the covenant. The weakness of the law, it depends on at least two people. Not only the law giver, but the law keeper as well. At the point here, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. God does not need a mediator. He does not need a go-between to make his promises good. His promise is not a contract between us and him. It's his promise. It stands whether we accept and reap the benefits of it or not. It depends on his immutability, his unchangeability. Of course, what does the Hebrews writer tell us? Jesus Christ is what? The same. Yesterday, today, yea, and forever. God dealt with Abraham without a mediator. God dealt with Abraham face to face. He just, here's my promise. And Abraham believed it. And that fact causes Abraham to be accounted righteous. On the other hand, at Mount Sinai with Moses, what does God do? God gives a law. And it is mediated in a manner of speak, speaking. By angels. That's an inferior relationship to the promise. Our mediator is Christ. God in the flesh. Not Moses. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God in the flesh. Who is God? God is Jesus. Deity. God is one. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 that we talked about a minute ago. Our God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Go to Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 10 and 11. The sanctified and Christ, the saved and Christ are one. How are we one with him? Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, he's the head, we're the body. We're connected to him. We're part of him. Well, if Jesus is God, and God is one, and he is, and we're connected to Jesus, the sanctified and the Christ are one, part of the same body. He's the head, we're the body, and we are. What does that tell us about our relationship with God the Father? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, John 17 Jesus' prayer, verses 20, 20, uh, 21, 22, 23, that they may all be what? 
one, even as I, Father, am in thee. The sanctified, the saved, are one with God through Jesus. Well, is the law against the promise of God? Does, does the law somehow negate God's promise? Is it contrary to God's promise? <laughs> Don't be absurd. Certainly not. God forbid. Uh, in that passage, you have something similar to uh, Romans chapter 6. The, the name of God does not appear in the text here in, in that God forbid context, but rather the idea is, is of course not. Don't be absurd. Don't be ridiculous, as it were. Uh, you, you have a, a second-class conditional sentence here. The emphasis is that's not the case. If a law had been given that could give life, then righteous would indeed be by the law. But that's not possible. The law cannot in itself give life. It can only define righteous versus unrighteous. Go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> God would have given that law. Why would He have given you this in spirit law? But the law could actually do this. Wouldn't He have given you the one that could impart life? That's an interesting thought. I hadn't hadn't considered it quite from that angle. Yeah. Got that one. Yeah. Why Why would He give you one that's inferior? Yeah. If there, if there's a better one, why would he not give you the better one in the first place? Right. Which begs the question, if God is the giver of all good gifts, why would he give you an inferior gift? Exactly. Good point. Good point. Well, the scripture has done what? Verse 22. It has confined all under sin. It, it has concluded or it, it has made us captive, imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believed. And this, the, the imagery here is interesting. It's, it's like being enclosed on all sides, imprisoned uh, in maximum security as if the, the door is shut, the lid is placed on the dungeon. There is no escape. Before faith came, we were kept in guard under, kept under guard by the law. Why? Kept for the faith that afterward would be revealed. Until the coming faith would be revealed. Guarded by the law. What was the law meant for? Well, it was given because of transgression, verse 19. What was the law meant to do? Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. Meant to guide, regulate, purify, not through its ordinances, but through faith in the coming one. Interesting thought here. Interesting question. Why does it seem that doomed people hesitate to accept deliverance from sin by God's unadulterated, unmixed faith and their own, uh, God's unmixed grace, rather, and their own unadulterated, unmixed faith? Why is it, in other words, why does it seem to be so hard for us to accept what God offers without expecting, imposing our own concept of law and conditions on it? The Israelites, recipients of the promise, beneficiaries of all people, recipients of the law. Why was it so hard for them to look past that, to the object of the exercise? The law was our tutor, schoolmaster. I love the way 
uh, Guy and Woods describes this Greek word to illustrate the relationship here to bring us to Christ. The tutor here is not the teacher. The tutor is the household slave who takes the sons of the household back and forth in Greek and Roman families from home to the teacher so they can be taught and then brings them home again. They tended to every point, every part of the child's life at home and at school. They spent the time with the child at home. They were the caretaker of the child. They made sure the kid did his homework as well. They trained the boy in all asset, all, all facets of life. Uh, <laughs> boys being boys, they get to adolescence. What would they want to do? Get away from the tutor as soon as possible. Why? I'm big enough. I don't need a tutor anymore. I don't. I don't need someone to escort me and and discipline me and 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 regulate my life. I can do that for myself. Well, the time comes in the boy's life when he can. When does that time come? Exactly. When he's grown, when he's no longer a boy but a man and is now fully responsible himself for his own actions. Prior to that, if he misbehaves, if he gets in trouble, who gets beaten? <laughs> it's not the kid. It's the slave for allowing that to happen. But the tutor, his time comes and goes in the child's life. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now that faith has come, now that we're full grown in terms of accountability, responsibility, we're no longer under a, a tutor. Uh, the schoolmaster is dismissed. How so? What made the difference? The tutor brought us. Paul speaking of Jews, the tutor brought us to the teacher. Who's the teacher? Christ. So the tutor is dismissed. You've reached the goal. The tutor came, brought the child to the teacher, and was dismissed. Exactly. We're no longer under a tutor. How so? How did we get to the teacher? By faith. By faith, not by faith and law. Chuck Horner has suggested, and Chuck was one of my teachers many years ago. Chuck suggests that, that this may be Satan's most ingenious masterpiece of deception, persuading people that we can weave two contradictory systems together. Grace and law, faith and law, justification by combining the two. Grace depends on law, but we're not justified by law, we're justified by faith. You're all sons of God, how? Through faith in Christ Jesus. Go ahead, Mike. It ain't about me. It ain't about me. Don't well, believe in me. I'm just trying to get you over there. It ain't about me. It's over there. Well, I would think the schoolmaster would use proper grammar, but yes. yes <laughs> Colloquialism, yes. Yes. And that that is that is part that is part of the point. The law was was the law was never the focus. The law was the tool. The law was the means to an end. Exactly. Exactly. You're all sons of God. Now, in this context, it has to be clear all is not all Jews, but Jews and Gentiles alike. Through faith, by means of the faith. Not just, not just your personal faith, but the faith which is in Christ Jesus. As many of you as were baptized in Christ have 
put on Christ. You were baptized ace Christ into, in the direction of Christ. Not because of Christ, in the direction of Christ. And the result? No division anymore. There are no more Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, male, female. Your nationality, your race, your your social status, your gender, that's it doesn't matter. You're part of the same body. We're one in Christ. And if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. In Christ is the test. Your race, it doesn't matter. Your social standing, it doesn't matter. Your gender, and there are only two, doesn't matter. If you're in Christ, that's what matters. In Christ is to be Abraham's seed. To be an heir, an inheritor of the promise. The promise was given to Abraham and to his seed. Verse 16, the Christ. If you're Christ, you're an heir of the promise made both to Abraham and Christ. That's simple. Well, it's actually a little past time for our break, so let's break here. We'll resume in 15 minutes, and then we'll look into chapter 4 and see if we can't get through that and maybe even look at one or two verses in chapter 5. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started in chapter 4. And in chapter 4, what what Paul does, he's following up his his logical appeal in chapter 3 with a series of illustrations to make the point this is why the law came first and this is why it has to give way to the gospel. So in chapter 4, as we enter into this, I mean that the heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. This goes back to the whole uh, tutor schoolmaster thing at the end of chapter three. By 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 all rights, there should not be a break right here uh, between the end of chapter three and chapter four. If they're going to put a break in, it really should have come uh, probably at verse seven or verse twelve in chapter four. But the heir, as long as he's still a child, has no rights in in effect. Uh, he, he's not responsible for himself, but he also does not have the privileges. He does not get to enjoy the privileges of being the heir at this point. He, he's surrounded with restrictions. What, what do you do with a, with a toddler child, a small toddler child, when you don't want it to wander off? You lock the doors. You, maybe, you, maybe you put it in a playpen. A playpen as tall as the child. Can't very well climb out of it until he gets a little more height and a little more skill on him. Why do you do that? For his protection. Does the child want to be in the playpen? Maybe not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Want out. But you do it for his protection. Why did God hedge his people around with the, the fencing, the structure of the law? For their protection. Now, Paul makes the point the inheritance is legally. This child's, but he has no power to dispose of. He's not allowed to touch it yet. You go back to the the parable of the two sons that Jesus taught. The what we call the prodigal son is really the parable of three prodigals. The prodigal father, who is prodigal, excessive in his extraordinary love for both of his sons. The younger son, who is prodigal, excessive, outrageous in, in his wasteful condition. And the prodigality, the excess of bitterness on the part of the older son. We call it the prodigal son and focus on the younger son. And the lesson is as much for the older son as it is for the others. And who's the older son in the parable? The the Jews, the Pharisees that Jesus is dealing with. Exactly. But here's the point. The The younger son comes to his father and says, what? Give me. My inheritance. It's not his to control until the father releases it to him. By 
right of birth. He's master of, of his share of, of all that, that is part of his inheritance, but not until the father releases it. By the way, in Roman law, there was not a specified age. In other words, at 18, you did not come of age and, and could do what you wanted. You were still under your father's authority uh, until he released you, basically. He's under guardians and, and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Uh, that would be the, the tutors, the schoolmasters, whatever teachers uh, were hired by the parents, anyone who has care of the child. And, and the stewards would be those who tend to the child's property, the child's estate. So what's the application? Verse 3, we, particularly Jews, Jewish Christians, we were children enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. That is, uh, we were under bondage to the elements of the world. But we who else in this scenario? Not just the Jews. We Christians. What had Paul shown in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3? Jew and Gentile alike had the same fundamental problem. What was the problem? Sin. There, there's no distinction with God between the sins of Jews and the sins of Gentiles. There's no distinction with God between the need for salvation for Jews and the need for salvation for Gentiles. What did he do? He provided the same solution for both sides of that equation. When the fullness of time came, when the right moment arrived, God sent forth his son. Literally, he sent out his son. It's interesting that that word is the, the root of the word for apostle in our text. Jesus is the father's apostle. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 3, and what do you read in verse 1? Consider Jesus the what? Apostle of our faith. When the right moment came, God sent his son. He sent his apostle, born of a woman, woman born, made subject to the law. How was he made subject to the law? By virtue of who bore him. He was born to a Jewish woman. Therefore, he was subject to the law. To what end? We, we need to con connect verses 4 and 5 because this is one statement. Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. To receive what's due. To receive what's needed. What had God promised through Abraham? I'll give you territory. I'll give you descendants. I'll bless everybody through you. This is the fulfillment of that promise, to receive what God promised. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. We would not be sons. If, if we were not sons, we would not have received the spirit. Now, go back to chapter 1, and here's the question Paul asks. How did you receive the gospel? Was it by hearing of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did, you, how did you receive the Spirit, rather? I think I said gospel. How did you receive the Spirit? By hearing of the law or by faith? Well, by faith. We would not be sons if we'd not received the Spirit. We received the Spirit, therefore we're sons, crying, Abba, Father. And that, that crying out is, is appealing to God, a, an emotional expression. Now, there's a distinction here. Who can call him Abba? Who can call him Father? His children. Strangers, slaves, would call him what? The stranger because they want something, and the slave because they're property. Master. But the child calls him Father. Therefore, you're no longer 
a slave, but a son. And if you're a son, then you're an heir of God through Christ. So the first illustration is, is based on relationship. Believers are now full-grown sons and daughters of God. We've been given our freedom in a manner of speaking, and with it, the power and the responsibility to use that freedom responsibly, to use that freedom in Christ for its purpose. Uh, you are an heir of God by means of God. You're an heir because of what God has done for you. Well, how is it that you become an heir of God? Paul's going to talk about that as we go along. You did not know God. When you did not know God, you served those which by nature are no gods. Now, this would seem to be directed at the Gentile Christians, wouldn't it? You served as slaves by nature, those who are not gods. You were not denying uh, their existence. Paul is not denying their existence, but their deity. Who did they serve? Okay. Images and, and imaginations. And 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 20, uh, demons, evil spirits, as it were, so called gods, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6. Go back to, to Paul in Athens, or maybe at this point go forward to Paul in Athens. In Acts chapter 17, verse 29, images made by hands. These are no gods. Yeah, yeah. Even even the fear of leaving someone out. In Deuteronomy 32, at verse 21, Israel in the wilderness does what? Think about the timing here. Where is Israel? Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. Israel, in fact, is at the border of the promised land. They're in the plains of Gilgal, about to cross over. But what's going on in Deuteronomy 32? The book of Deuteronomy is what? Deuteronomos, a, a repetition of the law for whom? Okay, for a new generation. Israel's greatest generation, as they would eventually uh, turn out to be. But what is Moses doing? Repeating the law, reminding them, do this and be blessed, do that and be cursed. Don't follow your faithless parents' example. And by way of repeating the law, what does he do? He takes them back through their own brief national history. So in Deuteronomy chapter 32, where has he taken them? Back to the foot of Mount Sinai. What happened at the foot of Mount Sinai while Moses was up on the mountain? Yeah, jumped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I just threw all this golden stuff in there and, the, and this jumped out of the fire, Moses. Right. They provoked God by worshiping a no God. That, that, that is no God. And so what, so what did God do? God provoked them by calling them a no people. <laughs> you think I'm a nobody God? You're a nobody people. And I have made you into a somebody people. After you've known God or more properly been known by God, how can you turn back to the weak, worthless, beggarly elements of the world, elementary principles. Why do you want to be slaves to that once more? Now, the expression here, how, how is it that you turn again, it is actually present tense. It's actually asking, why are you turning now in the process of turning back to this? The, the, 
the fundamental elements, basic elements in nature in learning. Why, why are you going back to your ABCs? Really, this, this statement, this question parallels what the Hebrews writer uh, says. Uh, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone, this is Hebrews 6, you ought to be teachers by now. You've been Christians long enough. You need someone to teach you again the elements of the first principles. Really what he's saying is you need somebody to teach you your ABCs so that you can learn to read and le learn the gospel all over again. Well, that's the gist of what Paul is saying here. You need to go back to the fundamentals. Now, in this context, go back to the fundamentals. What, what's, a, what's a religious legal system? That's what he's talking about here. That law, what's that for? What were those people in Moses' day? They were spiritually immature. In fact, they were so spiritually immature that they did what? <laughs> they worshiped that no God, and then they got mad. They were angry when God called them a nobody people. J.W. McGarvey has written, Paul reminds them at this time of the time of their wardship, they're being in ward or under bondage, uh, that their condition differed from that of the Jews. Uh, they had no copy of God's will or law. Uh, they were in more severe bondage because they were in idolatry. Uh, having come from that degraded, poverty-stricken state into full sonship, where they're known by God and they know Him, they should have been even more impressed by the contrast than were the Jews. You observe days and months and seasons and years. You're, you're being very careful about this. Now, bear in mind, the Galatian congregations are being impacted by Judaizing teachers, folks trying to impose law on them that, that's no part of their heritage. Whether this reference at verse 10 takes them back to their previous observations as idolaters, or whether it substitutes the requirements of the Judaizers, it makes no difference. The practical effect is the same. Uh, you're, you're focused on not overlooking any detail. And a merely legal religion, by the way, always develops those kinds of observances. And you're making a religion out of something that's an external. Which day belongs to God? Go back to chapter 2, to, uh, go to Colossians, rather, chapter 2, and notice in verse 16 that every day is God's day. Every day, in one sense, is the Lord's. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Paul made the same point in Romans chapter 14. Now, Paul writing to these folks says, I'm afraid for you. I'm afraid of you, the King James Version says, but I'm afraid on your behalf. I, I'm, I'm afraid that I have wasted my effort, that I bestowed my labor on you in vain. I'm afraid about you, concerning you. Uh, Paul still has hope. I hope this is not the case, but it certainly could be that this would have been wasted effort. So the appeal, become as I am, verse 12, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. Become as I am. What had Paul done as a Christian He had become what they are. 
in a figure, he had become a Gentile. I've become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. His appeal to them is that they not seek to become Jews, but seek to become what he is. What is he? Neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. I'm in Christ. That's the focus. That's the emphasis. That's what matters. So become as I am now. You have not injured me at, at, at all at any time. You, you've, you've not done me any harm. There, there's no issue to which you need to repent to me. Maybe an issue where they need to repent before God. By physical infirmity, I was detained. I preached to you the gospel at first. Now, how, how is, what, what is this all about in verse 13? A bodily ailment. I preached the gospel to you at first. Through my condition, though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What was the, what was the trial in his flesh? I don't know. He doesn't say. They knew, and that's what mattered. He says, you did not despise me. Literally, <laughs> this is a, a very vivid statement, actually. You didn't spit me out. It was something that, that might have been uh, unpleasant to them or, or not appealing to them, but they did not let that interfere. Uh, you did not reject me. You did not despise me as, as being of, of no value or no account. Instead, they received him. Exactly. Yeah. It's not in any way crucial or essential that we understand what Paul was. Okay. Whether this was the thorn in the flesh or something else, we don't even know. But your point is well taken. Go find you a stack of commentaries on Galatians and read all of the different speculations about what Paul is talking about here as far as physical ailment. The text, the Bible, does not tell us. It just simply says there was something there. What it was doesn't matter. Instead of spurning Paul over it, though, they treated him as if he were Jesus himself. They received him. They accepted him as if he were the Lord himself. Now, what was the blessing that you enjoyed? If possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Uh, what was what was your state? You, you were blessed spiritually. You were prospered by this. You would have dug out your own eyes and given them to me. Uh, you, that's that's how much kinship, how much compassion, how much appreciation they had for him. What's changed? Have I become your enemy now? Because I'm telling you the truth. Truth hurts sometimes. Truth hits you square between the eyes. Jump off the 10-story building and truth is the pavement hurts when you hit the pavement. In the meantime, these Galatian Christians are being uh, intensely courted, zealously courted by somebody. It's not Paul. It's those whose objective is actually to exclude them from the church, exclude them from the kingdom of God. Look at verses 17, verse 17 down into verse 18 here in chapter 4. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that they may that, that you may make much of them. It's always good to be made uh, much of for a good purpose. And not only when I'm present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish that I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I'm perplexed about you. All right, what's going on? You've got Judaizers that are trying to exclude these Christians. Now, how so? They're telling them you've got to keep the law in addition. To have faith. 
you're going to they're they're going to exclude these Christians from the church. Now that's not what they're saying. They're trying to show what well, you were not rightly converted because you're not keeping the law. What would happen? You believe those folks? Oh dear, we've got a problem. What do we do? Oh, it's all right. We've got you covered. Do what we tell you. They would turn to the Judaizers for counsel, for advice. The feeling lost. Oh dear, we Paul didn't tell us everything. We we haven't. What what else do we need to do? We'll tell you. What happens then? They really do become lost once more. The the American Standard Version puts it this way, and it's actually an excellent rendering of, of this verse. They zealously seek you in no good way. Nay, they desire to shut you out that you may seek them. They're trying to cut you off from the gospel, trying to cut you off from the influence of Paul and those who have their welfare at heart. Why? So that they can control you, so that you'll turn to them and let them control you. It's good to be zealous in a good thing. Not only when I'm present with you. Now, what Paul says here at verse 18, in effect, is I I courted you. I courted you just like they court you, in a sense. But in my case, it was with a good spirit. It was in the right manner. It was in connection with the truth of the gospel. It was not for my benefit. It was not so I can control you. It was for your benefit. My little children, my, my born ones, I labor in birth again. That's the only place that Paul uses this phrase, this expression. Until Christ is formed in you. He's he's not talking about some kind of a mysterious experience. But rather, he's talking about seeing Christ in them. He's not talking about some kind of a, a mysterious experience in the life of the believer. Oh, Christ is born in me. Something of, of that sort, something miraculous or or what have you. He's saying, I'm I'm anticipating seeing the fruit of the gospel in you. I would like to be present with you and change my tone. I have doubts. I'm perplexed. I I don't understand this. I don't get this. Think about what Paul is saying here. He's talking to them like a parent, isn't he? Not a scolding parent, but a reasoning parent. He's capable of being very tender. And that's what he's doing with them. He's not trying to tell them my way or the highway. He's trying to get them to reason for themselves with the proper information to the right conclusion. Tell me, now he changes the focus. In verse 21, you who would be justified, who would be under the law, have you not listened to the law? Do you not hear what it says? The last argument here from 21 to 31 appeals directly to the scripture. He's given illustrations. He's reasoned with them. Now, here's what the, what, what the scripture itself says. The law contradicts their current trend in belief. Look at verse 21. Do you not listen to the law? It is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman, but the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according to the promise. This is one of the few allegories in the New Testament, indeed in the whole Bible. Uh, There is that... uh, theological bent in the world today, most notably in Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox and to a lesser degree in Reformed religions and theologies, that makes everything in the Bible allegorical, and it's not. In this particular case, the illustration is an allegory, which means, in essence, that the details have significance beyond just carrying the story along. So, here's the appeal. There are two types of law in this verse. Those of you who would be under 
law do you not hear the law? The first is any law. It says under the law in most translations, but in fact it's under law, generally speaking. But uh, in the second case, we're talking about specifically the law of Moses, which is uh, used interchangeably in this context for the, the sum total of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, uh, the writings of Moses, but really everything from Genesis to Malachi. What's the application? Okay, Abraham had two sons. Abraham had more than that, but the two that are in focus here are Ishmael and Isaac. He received two sons. One, natural process of conception. Hagar bore him a son. If physical descent from Abraham is so important, then the Jews are better off than the Ishmaelites because Abraham had a son before Isaac was born. Isaac was the child of the promise. Ishmael was the child according to the flesh through the natural processes of, of conjugal relations. Isaac, though, came by means of the promise. The free woman could not conceive naturally. When she taunted Sarah over Angel's food, she gave Abraham a son, but yet she taunts Sarah because she can't have food. And that she, that couldn't have bode well. No, no, that, that did not bode well. That's why Sarah drove her out. In this scenario, though, there's nothing, nothing extraordinary about Hagar's son. For Sarah's son, though, it took a miracle of God in response to Abraham's and Sarah's faith. Uh, the natural son was born according to the natural order of things. Abraham and Hagar got together, and Ishmael was the result. The promised son was unnatural in a sense. Abraham and Sarah got together. An act of faith, in a sense, on their part. And God responded with a miraculous scenario. Yeah, Elizabeth was past past the age at the time that John was born. Had been married plenty of years. But regardless, Paul in verse 24 says, here's the point. These things are symbolic. They're an allegory, the King James Version says. These things are uh, interpreted allegorically. The two women represent two covenants. Hagar as a slave would have given birth to children who would be what? They would not be heirs. They would be servants. They would be slaves. Sarah, on the other hand, as the wife, gives birth to an heir. The law from Sinai brings forth slave children only. The application that, that Paul makes. Uh, the two women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. The other is Jerusalem above, free. She is our mother. Now, the rabbis <clears throat> would interpret the scripture uh, with at least four different meanings here. And usually, the least important interpretation was what the text said. That is the literal meaning. Uh, the peshat, the, the simple, the, just the obvious meaning, literal meaning. And then there is the pramaz, the suggested meaning, and the derush, which is evolved and deduced by investigation. What, what can we get out of this? What can we figure out? 
And then there's the so the allegorical meaning. Paul is saying, all right, here's the allegorical. Here's the application meaning here. This is, in the Jewish perspective, the peak of interpretation at that time. But when all had been discovered, you've reached the, the paradise of, of, of exposition. You've reached the high point. Well, all right, here's the high point. Bringing Jerusalem into the allegory casts a shadow on the Judaizers' claim that the church's example in Jerusalem should be followed by the Gentiles. They're, they're saying you need to be just like Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, is free, the mother of us all. Well, which Jerusalem are we talking about? It's not Jerusalem down there in Judea. Jerusalem above, heavenly Jerusalem. What does that represent? Grace, faith, the perfect law of liberty, the way of salvation. He's making a conscious distinction between Mount Sinai, the earthly location where the law was given, and heavenly Jerusalem, not literal Jerusalem. He's not comparing two points on the globe, but one point on the globe and a point in heaven. Heavenly Jerusalem represents grace and faith and, and, and hope and all of these things. Now, in, in verse 27, you have a quotation from Isaiah 54 and verse 1, Rejoice, O barren who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who do not travail. The desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Uh, the, who, who's, who's the barren one here? Well, that's Sarah. Shout, cry aloud. The desolate. Well, who's the desolate one here? It's not Sarah after all. It's Hagar. We, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. What's the whole focus of the Judaizers' contention? Oh, the promise was to Abraham, and he's our father, and, and, and the law came through Moses, and we've got to hang on to the law, and, and so forth, and they're trying to exclude anybody else from any association with Abraham. Sonship, heirship, being a seed of Abraham it is the subject, but the manner in which we're born into Abraham or born to Abraham as his child, that determines everything here. Verse 28, are you a child of Abraham because of a fleshly connection to him? Or are you a child of Abraham because of a spiritual connection to him? He who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even as it is now. Even so it is now. Well, what, what, uh, what are we talking about here? Jewish tradition said that Ishmael uh, shot arrows at Isaac out in the field just, just for the fun of it, tormented his younger brother in, in a sense. Scripture doesn't, doesn't say how Ishmael uh, persecuted or tormented Isaac, but what's the point that Paul is making? The son of the flesh, sons according to the flesh, are not willing to live with sons according to the Spirit. Who hates grace? Most of all, who in the world, who among men hates grace most of all? There you go. Someone who is determined to save himself by law, to save himself instead of to be saved. Well, that's, in a practical sense, that's the definition of the Judaizer, is it not? They're going to save themselves. Yes, salvation is by faith, but you have to do, as we say, we're going to set the ultimate standard. What does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. The son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. 
shall be, in in no means by no means shall he inherit. He's not the heir. Go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry, don't mention. Uh, uh, talk about this the other night. Uh, one of the commentators that read Jeff he contrasts law and grace in this way. He says the law is, um, I really like the way he did it. He says the law is uh, uh, keeping, let's see, keeping, well, breaking the commandment. I mean, keeping the commandments suffer the penalty. In other words, keeping the keeping commandments. Uh, Keep the commandment, escape punishment. Escape the penalty. Escape the penalty. Escape penalty. Break the commandments, suffer the penalty. Yeah. Grace is breaking the commandments, escape, escape the, penalty, the penalty, as well as uh, keep uh, uh, keeping commandments, suffer the penalty, and that refers only to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's the only one kept the commandments, but he suffered our penalty. Exactly. So here, verse thirty-one. We're not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. What's the comparison? The son of the slave woman, she's the Old Testament. Son of the free woman is the New Testament. We're not children of the bond woman, but of the free. Brethren, tender close to a pointed argument. Many people who claim to be God's children are living day in and day out in mortal terror of hell as if they do not have a Savior. Question. Is fear of hell an illegitimate motive for obedience to the gospel of Christ? There you go. Fear of here's the point. Fear of hell is not an illegitimate motive. Our our world of uh, grace only, grace only, grace only, uh, without consideration of the faith advocates, the denominational community at large, has put about the idea that fear of hell is is illegitimate, that it's it's not a valid motive to love the Lord. If I were not afraid of hell, why would I love the Lord? I would have no no way of appreciating what he has done for me. Is it the best motive? Perhaps not. It's an immature motive in some respects. It ought to lead me to love and appreciation for and gratitude toward God. But it's not illegitimate. Many people who claim to be God's children nevertheless live every day of their lives in mortal terror as if there is no Savior. They doubt that their sins have actually been forgiven if they're not also keeping some sort of checklist type law by which they can measure their own righteousness. But that's not what the New Testament prescribes. Mike, go ahead. Thanks for the point. Jesus said, fear not those who kill the body that can do nothing so, but I'd rather fear him and destroy both body and soul in hell. Mm -hmm. He used that exactly. as a motivator in what he said. Exactly. So fear, it, be a proper motivator. fear is not illegitimate, but it's not the only consideration. Should not be. It may be the initial consideration. There you go. So that brings us to chapter five. And in, in the next five minutes, we will cover, or four minutes now, we'll cover chapters five and six and be done. No, in reality, we have one more class, not next week. Next week is Thanksgiving. We'll take that week off. The following week, we'll have our final class. We'll cover chapters 5 and 6 and do a, a thumbnail review of, of Romans and Galatians, primarily Galatians, uh, in anticipation of the final exam. But chapters 5 and 6, 
just by way of a little bit of introductory thought here, uh, we have five minutes left. So what does Paul do now? He has reasoned with them. He has argued with them, as it were. Now he's going to appeal to them, appeal to steadfastness, to be faithful, to, in effect, to do your duty as a Christian. And he starts by talking about what they've obtained, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, through the gospel. What has the free woman brought them? Liberty. Freedom. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again in a yoke of bondage. Here's the summary of that, that whole allegory that started back there at, at chapter 4, verse 21. Stand in the, the liberty for the freedom that you've received in Christ. Jesus died to give you the advantage that you have, which is liberty from law. Go back to John chapter 8 and verse 36, and Jesus himself talks about that. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. The, the point here is that you, if you receive this as, a, as an ordinance, as a, as a requirement, uh, you, you've, as a supplement, you've taken Christ out of the picture. You, you, you've said salvation is not in Christ, it's in Christ plus. Well, there is no premium version. Of Christ. There's, there's not Christianity and then Christianity plus. There is salvation in Christ, period. A supplemented Christ is a supplanted Christ, Brother Chuck used to say. So here in verse three, I testify, I'm going to certify to you, I protest this to you. Every man who becomes circumcised. Is a debtor to keep the whole law. And what he's really saying to these Galatians is, all right, look, folks, you either have to accept the whole of Christ or you have to accept the whole of the law. But you can't have both at the same time. They're not compatible. If you refuse Christ, you have to keep the whole law. You can't just keep parts of it like these Judaizers are telling you. You have to do the whole thing. And that's, it's beside the point. That does not you no good because it no longer has any power. You, you become, in effect, abusers of it because it's meant to do exactly one thing, which is what? Bring you to Christ. That was the whole object of the exercise. So in verse 4, you have become estranged. You are severed from Christ. You're cut off. Uh, the idea is, is you, you've been amputated from Christ who would be justified by the law. No two ways about it. You can't have both. You are fallen from grace. You have fallen. If this is where you are, you have fallen. You've become estranged. Christ has no effect on you. He, he, in effect, Paul is saying, Jesus can't do anything for you in this condition. If you're trying to be justified by the law, sorry, Jesus can't help you. You're, you're, you've turned away by being circumcised in order to be justified by the law, in order to get that plus factor. You, you've canceled out Christ. You're guilty of apostasy. There's no justification available for you in that scenario. You're not under the grace of Christ. You're under the condemnation of the law. We'll go to Hebrews chapter 10. And what does the Hebrews writer say in verses 26 and 27 over here? In Hebrews 10, as the writer is reasoning with these folks, these Jewish, uh, Judean Christians, he says in verses 26 and 27, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Oh, it's 28, I'm sorry. 
If we go on sinning deliberately, verse 26, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a cer certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Can't have it both ways. You can't have Jesus plus. You can have Jesus, period. You have fallen from grace. You're severed. You're cut off. Now, our Calvinistic friends tell us that's impossible for those whom God has chosen. I guess if that's true, then Paul was writing to a bunch of people who were reprobate in the first place, isn't he? These folks were not ever saved in the first place by that thinking, by that logic. Though we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We, Christians, as opposed to the legalists, the Judaizers, we're eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness, the final verdict. What's the hope of righteousness? I'll be acquitted in divine judgment. We have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous, Peter says. Am I innocent of sin? No. I am convicted and condemned. But my penalty has been paid in Christ. So my advocate can stand and say, my blood covers this one. Our time is up. That's a good place for us to stop. We'll pick up, Lord willing, next time at verse 6 in chapter 5. Do read ahead, and I will look forward two weeks from tonight. Questions, comments, thoughts before we dismiss? All right. Thank you very much for being here. I have enjoyed this immensely.